Please receive our brother, Brother Dimitri Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Allow us to begin in the most holy name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. I bear witness that there is no God except that Allah is God. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. We give to Allah praise and thanks for his grace, for his mercy, for all of that which he has blessed us with. We have been taught in the scriptures that during the night, while we rest and slumber, the Quran says that Allah takes possession of our souls and he makes a decision as to whether or not he shall return our soul to our bodies or that he might keep the soul with its origin, which is himself. We don't know too whole, a whole lot about this because we are just resting, sleeping, slumbering. But we know that when we awaken in the morning, that Allah made a decision to return our souls to our bodies so that we might live to see a new day. So it is said that every day the believing men and women begin that day with gratitude and thanksgiving and praise to Almighty God Allah for blessing us with at least one more day of life. There's nothing greater we have been taught than the precious and the irreplaceable gift of life. Right after the gift of life, we bear witness that the next greatest gift is the gift of guidance for life. I think you would agree with me. We live in a world today where the gift of life is often wasted, abused, and even misused. So Allah has given to us a gift of guidance for life, that if we would follow the guidance, we could achieve the aim and purpose for which we were born. So in Islam, we believe in all of the scriptures that really make up the divine guidance from God to man and woman that have ever appeared on the earth. The Holy Quran teaches us that Allah, out of his mercy, never leaves a people in error without furnishing that people a revealed message that is subsequently compiled and transcribed and preserved in the form of a book. We grew up in the church learning about the Bible. You came to Muhammad and he began to teach you about the Quran. But these books did not fall down from the sky. I know you got a green Quran on your bookshelf or in your briefcase, but it didn't fall from the sky with a green cover printed on onion skin paper. Scripture comes to us through Allah's careful choosing of a man and in some cases a woman from among a suffering people. And out of his love and compassion for that people, not wanting them to continue in error, not wanting to see them fail or be recipients of his divine wrath, he reveals to such a human being guidance, warning, previously hidden truth, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. These persons of whom I speak are what we know to be the prophets and the messengers of Allah. Abraham and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad. In Islam, we believe in them all. We make no distinctions regarding the divine servants of God. 
we thank a lot for all of them and we thank a lot for all of the scriptures that they brought. In our message today, however, we want to become more contemporary in our focus. We want to be a little bit more specific in our focus. We want to take our minds away from Arabia and the Middle East of 1400 and 2000 years ago and we want to come to the United States of America. We want to talk about the presence of Allah God in America. When we begin, we always have what they call a peculiar salutation because we have to now at this late hour be witness bearers not just of the goodness and the greatness of God in times past but we have to also be witness bearers of the goodness and the greatness of God to us today so as a student of my and our illustrious teacher the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan I could never thank Allah enough for his divine, providential, and merciful intervening into the tumultuous affairs of black people in America, having made his divine presence known in the person of Master Fard Muhammad. We not only thank him for his coming, but we also thank him for a work that he did among us. We thank him for the greatest witness bearer of his time among us and that he identified one of us that he could spiritually impregnate with wisdom to guide you and I through the fall of America into the establishment of the kingdom of God. I'm speaking about a man that most in black America, even though God raised him from us and for us, we don't have but a little knowledge about him. Our enemies have been busy trying to throw mud on his name. They tried to put him in the dustbin of history. But Allah throughout the scriptures makes it known that he is present for the victory of his servants. And so we thank a lot that you and I are here today and we are part of a growing minority who know the goodness and the greatness of that man that God first raised among us, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes, sir. We thank a lot for him and we thank a lot for his student, the man that who for the past 40 years has rebuilt the nation of Islam in America. Let that sink in for a moment because the Black Panther Party, it didn't get rebuilt. You have a new Black Panther Party, but it's not the same Black Panther Party with the strength and prominence of yesterday. You got a version of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, but certainly without the steam that it had under Dr. King. Hardly can you see anybody claiming to represent Marcus Garvey's organization, the United Negro Improvement Association. Few people here and there pledge loyalty to Noble Drew Ali in the Moorish Science Temple of America. But any positive group any strong group that rose up from amidst the suffering masses of black people to work for liberation for us, the United States government viewed them as enemies and worked to destroy them. And it thought that it had destroyed the nation of Islam in 1975. But I'm glad, I don't know about you, that Allah is so merciful and so powerful that he blessed you and I with a man that was not necessarily on the radar of the enemy. I seem to remember something in the scriptures about a ram being in the bush 
when Abraham went to sacrifice his son. God always has blessings, maybe just outside of what you and I can see. And so just outside of the purview of the enemy was the national representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The man that is today one whom we are growing to see and appreciate as a Messiah in our midst. He is the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Beloved brothers and sisters, in these three great names, I again extend to you the greeting words of peace of Asalaamu As Alaikum. How y'all feel today? I feel pretty good myself by the grace and mercy of Allah. And I'm excited to be able to be before you today. And I pray that Allah will bless us to share some words with you today that might be of aid and might be of support and might be of assistance to those of us who may be, in the first instance, thinking, do we want to come closer to the nation of Islam? And in the second instance, those that have come closer, come inside, accepted the faith, but have realized that the journey of faith is an uphill road. So our subject today is taken from Don't give me too much encouragement or you'll be here all day. <laughs> but we won't be here long because it don't take a whole lot of time to get the truth over today. But our primary text for consideration today is the 93rd surah of the Holy Quran. It reads in the English translation, and this is one of those short surahs. So for those of us who have learned Salat, you know after you say the Al-Fatiha, you have to recite a short surah. So, you know, this is one of those good ones that you can commit to memory because it's very short. This is the whole surah right here on this slide. It reads, by the brightness of the day. Again, our subject today is taken from this short surah. Thy Lord has not... I had to look up to clear the word forsaken. Colin says they're completely deserted or helpless, abandoned. The word forsaken. Moreover, it says that sometimes the word forsaken is synonymous with the word betray. This specific verse includes the word what? Regard. And I thought about this surah because this surah, the context of this surah, is the earliest of the revelations of the Holy Quran. Again, we are coming from the Christian church. We know a little bit about the Bible, 
even though I think you'll come to appreciate the fact that when you come into Islam, you will learn more about the Bible than you ever knew in your life as a Christian. But we are now getting into the Quran and the Quran is arranged a little bit different because in the Bible you have Genesis to Revelations. It's pretty much a chronological order, meaning that what happens in Genesis is first and what happens in Revelations is last. But the Quran has a different kind of arrangement. In fact about it, those surahs or chapters near the end of the Quran are actually many of those surahs that were revealed first. The very first surah is actually surah 96. But what's powerful about these surahs is the context of these surahs because even though these surahs comprise part of the message that Allah revealed through Muhammad, they also contain a message that Allah revealed specifically to Muhammad. So it's kind of like if the mailman delivered you a piece of mail and as a part of the mail that you received was also some instructions to the mailman himself. That's rather strange. But you know, in Islam, it is said that the believers follow the sunnah or the way of Muhammad. That's important because that means if that's true, then whatever Allah says to Muhammad, it also applies to you and to me. You see, when Muhammad received the call to be the messenger of Allah, it was not an occasion for celebration. I know there are many of us, especially in a place like Memphis Sunday morning, a lot of different kind of folk who stand up in a pulpit and they claim to be an apostle. They claim to be a prophet. And sometimes I wonder, do these persons know the history of God's prophets? Because if you know the history of God's prophets and apostles and messengers, and you want to stand up and say that you are that, I think you first might need to have your head examined. Because according to the Bible and the Quran, that was a perilous vocation. Most of the prophets of God were murdered. So no man that's sane is running around saying, pick me, pick me, pick me, God, to be your messenger. Which one of you brothers want to accept an assignment, accept a job position, where everybody else that held that position before you died in the line of duty? So Muhammad, he went through a traumatic experience. He left the cave of Hira and he went home to his wife Khadij and she had to wrap him in a blanket. So the 74th surah is Al-Mudathiyah, the one wrapping himself up. See all of those surahs at the end are giving you and I a message, but it was first a message to God's servant. And this specific surah deals with the fact that even after Muhammad went through that traumatic experience, God left him alone. He didn't understand the mercy of God was such that God saw the man go through the traumatic experience of just accepting the call. So the historians say that after that, that was what they call a cessation of revelation. Meaning that Allah revealed Quran to him, but then he stopped. And Muhammad began to wonder, was Allah displeased with him? He began to wonder, God, you didn't call me out of my comfortable place. He was a good man, always had been a good man. Called Amin. He was a fair and honest businessman, man minding his own business. And God bothered him and called him and disturbed him from his common ordinary life to accept a mission. And as he was just wrapping his mind around accepting that mission, it's like God, stop 
messing with him. Y'all know what y'all said, Mr. Price. So he felt some kind of way. And that's a natural reaction. He felt abandoned. He felt forsaken. He felt that he was receiving the punishment of God. So this is the human part of the divine. Now this feeling of being forsaken, I want to go from Muhammad again to you and I today. See, when you come to Muhammad's mosque, we don't just use the scriptures as a history book. We use the scriptures as a guide to the modern world. We use the scriptures to draw parallels from yesterday to today. Otherwise, the books of God don't have a lot of value to us. If you can't read in the word of God that which causes you to think about your own life, your own circumstances, your own condition, then you just, you're no better perhaps than the Shriners. You're no better perhaps than the professors who have to teach about Islam at a college. They may be experts in the history of the religion, but they're not believing Muslims. There's a lot of people that have knowledge about religion, but they are not believers. So they relegate the word of God to purely an intellectual exercise. But that ain't you. <laughs> that ain't me. We want the word in our life as a daily guide to help us navigate these critical times in which we live. All praise is due to Allah. I want to talk first about us as a people because part of our experience in America being stolen from Africa and not finding a warm reception in America instead we found harsh enemies in America made us a forsaken people reading and some of the writings about the experience and the condition of our enslaved foreparents. In one of America's first sociological studies called Democracy in America by the French writer Alexis de Tocqueville in 1831. Consider his description of black man and woman of America and our forsaken state of existence. He says, the Negro of the United States has lost all remembrance of his country. The language which his forefather spoke is never heard around him. He abjured or he forsake their religion and forgot their customs when he ceased to belong to Africa without acquiring any claim to European privileges. But he remains halfway between the two communities, sold by the one, repulsed by the other finding not a spot in the universe to call by the name of country except the faint image of a home which the shelter of his master's roof affords. The Tocqueville goes on to say the Negro has no family. The Negro who is plunged in the abyss of evils scarcely feels his own calamitous situation. Violence has made him a slave and the habit of servitude gives him the thoughts and desires of a slave. He admires his tyrants more than he hates them and finds his joy and his pride in the servile imitation of those who oppress him. The Negro enters upon slavery as soon as he is born. Nay, he may have been purchased in the womb and have begun slavery before he began his existence. Equally devoid of wants and of enjoyment and useless to himself, he learns with his first notions of existence that he is the property of another. 
See, in the mods, we have to give you this because you're not going to get it in Shelby County School. Unless you go to Mr. Muhammad's class over here. He'll share some of that with you. But I heard my brother Rodney talking when he opened up about the conditions among our young people. And when you go to the root of the conditions among our young people, you find that most of our young brothers and sisters have no knowledge of the history of their people. They don't know that when they kill another black man, they don't know when they abuse a black woman. They are abusing a people that American society has abused in a, in a tax for more than 400 years. And I say and I say again, look at the Jewish people, for example. They always talk about their holocaust of suffering under Adolf Hitler. And they say never again. And then they ensure that it'll never happen again because they never let any new generation of their babies forget what Hitler did to them. So young Jewish people, they have beefs. That's a natural thing, brother and sister, to have disagreements. It's a natural thing to sometimes fall out with one another. But they are informed by the history of their people suffering. So they may disagree, but they're not going to allow their disagreement in the modern era to do what Hitler couldn't do in the historical era. We have to begin to share with our babies the history of our people what we have overcome, what we have gone through. And how in this society, our African brothers and sisters who helped sell us into slavery, we ended up in this country of forsaken people. When you come into the later 1800s, you should learn something about what they call the Compromise of 1877. Do you know what they call the Compromise of 1877? They call it the Great Betrayal of the Negro. The Great Betrayal of the Negro. At the Wormley Hotel, on a very strange date, February the 26th, 1877. If you get a book called The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, volume number two, which you should have in your library, it talks about why the compromise of 1877 is so significant. Now, you all read the Final Call newspaper. You know that on the back page of the Final Call newspaper, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that we want to have an independent nation. You think that that is such a far-fetched idea because most of us were raised looking at integration as the aspiration of our people. But would you believe, brother and sister, that when our foreparents were freed under the Emancipation Proclamation, we left the plantation not seeking to integrate back into the plantation. We went and we built 60, 80 independent towns and cities. You've heard of Rosewood. You've heard of Black Wall Street. That's just two. Why don't they never tell you about all of the rest of them? What happened to them? There was a conflict over who would be president in a neck and neck race between Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden. Hayes was the northern candidate. Tilden was the man of the south. They met at the Wormley Hotel. And they came up with a compromise. The compromise was this. The North said, if you let our man, if you concede and let Hayes become the president, we will give you instead the opportunity to take power again in the South. We will remove the federal troops that were protecting black people in the South that were helping to ensure that we were free to build those towns and cities without our former slave masters doing anything about it. So history records that after the compromise of 1877, 
Jim Crow took immediate and wide-ranging effect. Lynching, mass murders, racial pogroms, and general terror escalated. Black property was stolen, black schools were targeted, black voting rights were abolished. And whites moved blacks out of employment in the trades and industry, effectively locking them into plantation labor and domestic service. The Jewish scholar Morris Shapes caused the compromise of 1877, the great portrayal of democracy and the Negro people political treachery that reduced blacks to a state of economic poverty and political rightlessness. But our subject is thou art not for a savior. All right, all right. But that's a statement of now. Yes, I'm showing you that at a time we were for Satan. Pay attention that this very important historical moment that literally has shaped black people's reality in the modern times takes place on February the 26th, 1877. That date is not a date that's lost on those of us who are members of the Nation of Islam. And I'm reminded of a verse from the Holy Quran wherein it says, and the Jews planned, and Allah planned, and Allah is the best at planners. For you see, on the same day that a compromise took place, on the same day that our future going back into slavery was established, all the way over in Mecca, Arabia, a child was being born. He had a black father and a white mother. A child was being born. He was coming to birth on the same day that our enemies were planning our future. Not a glorious future, not a bright future, but a future that would reinstitute slavery just in different form. That's right, that's right. See, brother, that's why we have to work to get out of the criminal justice system. Because according to the 13th Amendment, prison is slavery. Yes, sir. The 13th Amendment does two things. It abolishes slavery, but it also defines the conditions that make slavery legal. Yes, sir. It is the constitutional overlay for what they call the prison industrial complex. So when you're doing your sentence, you really are serving time in the modern plantation. But I want to talk about Master Far Muhammad today. Our great brother, the local representative of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, brother student minister Abdul Muthakir Muhammad. He had a beautiful idea. He wanted to take the whole month of July since Master Far Muhammad came July 4th, 1930. He wanted to take the whole month and talk about the coming of Allah in the person of Master Far Muhammad. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. To give us the history to give us the significance of this and to introduce to many and present to some, as the old saying goes, the true history of Master Farmer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Some of us got acquainted with him a couple years ago, maybe it was a year or so ago, when our brother Buster Rhymes and Rick Ross did that song, Master Far Muhammad. And a lot of people are like, man, what is that? What is that about? See, but you got to understand, especially to my young brothers and sisters, historians have said that Islam is like the unofficial religion of hip-hop. Right. It came to birth as an art form that appeared to our enemies as a musical accompaniment to the preaching of Louis Farrakhan came to birth in the early 1970s in New York City. It came to birth when brothers from the hood, that so-called concrete jungle, they began to use poetry as a form of music. And what they were talking about in the early days of hip-hop, 
they were talking about the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Many of the earliest rappers emerged from the five percenters, an offshoot of the nation established by Brother Clarence 13X. And they began to popularize among young people the ideas and the principles, the language, the terminology, the jargon, if you will, of the nation of Islam. So Buster being one of those early rappers from back when me and Ilya Rashad were young, when we were younger men, he wanted to pay homage to the man that's the root of the knowledge explosion in black America. Some of you saw Spike Lee's movie Malcolm X. Raise your hand if you saw Spike Lee's movie Malcolm X. Do you remember in the movie when Malcolm was in prison? He has a vision. And then he, when he's in prison, it appears as though he, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad floats in and sits on his bed. It's a popular scene and it's, almost, it's portrayed as though this is Malcolm's Pauline experience. Paul on the road to Damascus has a vision of Jesus. He had been a man called Saul and he had persecuted the Christians. But in his experience, Jesus visits him and then he's converted to being a follower of Jesus. And his name changed from Saul to Paul. Well, this is Malcolm's similar experience. But Spike Lee, using creative license, he changed what Malcolm actually said. Malcolm did not say when he described this experience that it was his teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, that he saw floating into his prison cell. But he said he saw a man that looked like his teacher's teacher, Master Farah Muhammad. He said, I prayed for some time, for some kind of relief, for my confusion. It was the next night as I lay upon my bed, I suddenly, with a start, became aware of a man sitting beside me in my chair. He had on a dark suit. I remember I could see him as plainly as I see anyone I look at. He wasn't black and he wasn't white. He was light brown skinned an Asiatic cast of countenance, and he had oily black hair. I looked right into his face. I didn't get frightened. I knew I wasn't dreaming. I couldn't move. I didn't speak, and he didn't. I couldn't place him racially other than that I knew he was a non-European. Wasn't no white man. I had no idea whatsoever who he was. He just sat there. Then suddenly as he had come, he was gone. I would later come to believe that my prevision was of Master W.D. Farrar, the Messiah, the one whom Elijah Muhammad said had appointed him, Elijah Muhammad, as his last message. Why didn't Spike put that in the movie? Why didn't they introduce you? to this man. Why is he a carefully guarded secret? See, beloved brother and sister, you and I may not have an appreciation for the fact that one of the core component parts of our enslavement in this country has been the hiding of the true knowledge of God. You can't have slaves who know God. If the slave ever knows God, he will use his knowledge of God to rise up against his master to gain his freedom. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says on the back page of the final call in point number 12 that we believe that Allah God appeared in the person of Master W. Fard Muhammad. July 1930, the long-awaited Messiah of the Christians and the Mahdi of the Muslims. We believe further and lastly that Allah is God. And besides him, there is no God, and he will bring about a universal government of peace wherein we can all live in peace together. That's one of the most difficult points for people to accept. Oh, people don't mind him saying, we believe our women should be respected and protected as the women of other nations are. They don't mind that. 
They don't mind him saying, we want freedom from all believers in Islam now held in federal prisons. They don't mind that. They don't mind him saying, we want a full and a complete freedom. They don't even mind him saying, we believe in the truths of the Bible, but we believe that the Bible has been tampered with and must be reinterpreted so mankind won't be saved by the falsehoods added to it. But this one here, this get us into a lot of trouble. See, because the implications of this are global. The implications of this are universal. You got to throw your understanding of God and religion away if what Elijah Muhammad says about God is true. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said of point number 12 that it is the cardinal point in what we teach. This is our root. It's our foundation. It's sitting there as the cornerstone of the Muslim program. In the lower right corner, the base, the foundation upon which all of the other wants and beliefs rest upon. The word cardinal means a cardinal rule of quality is one that is considered to be the most important. Again, the knowledge of God has been kept hidden from us. We're in the Bible Belt, but what kind of Bible do you have? Do you know that they discovered what they call the slave Bible? You didn't even know that. They had a special Bible for you and I. Do you know that in America, they negotiated how you as a slave could become a Christian? It was a very controversial decision because in certain parts of the British Empire, it had been rumored that those who were enslaved, if they became Christians, if they were baptized into Christianity as believers, that they were given their freedom from slavery. So the slave masters in America feared that if they allowed the missionaries to evangelize the slave population, that they would be not only converting you to Christianity, but granting you your freedom. So they argued amongst themselves. And not only did they argue amongst themselves, but they argued against what the scriptures actually teach. See, it says in the Bible that in Christ, there is no bond nor free, no male nor female, no Jew nor Greek, all are one in Christ. How I'm going to be a Christian and my slave master is a Christian and he owned me. And we're supposed to be two brothers in Christ. So they literally had to stipulate that you can become a Christian but we're going to violate what the Bible actually teaches so that we might maintain you in your position as a slave. And so they cooked up this slave Bible. They say a rare Bible from the 1800s was used by British missionaries to convert and educate slaves. What's notable about this Bible is not just its rarity, but its content, or rather the lack of content. It excludes any portion of the text that might inspire rebellion or liberation. Think over this, brother and sister. See, the enemy knows that to a great degree, the nation of Islam in America is a byproduct of biblical teaching. That's right. That's right. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan have taken a Christian Bible and made a nation of Muslims. <laughs> Look at that. How come you ain't been able to make that in your church? How come you don't have no cadre of strong, fearless men that they call the dope busters in the church? See, there's something in the word of God 
that when it's taught properly, it removes fear from the heart of the believer. There's something in the word of God when it's preached properly makes a man stand up and want to be a man. But from the earliest days in the plantation, they gave you and I a Bible that had been castrated. They gave you and I the word of God in an impotent form. Moreover, the great brother that they call the father of black history in America, yes, Carter G. Woods, he identified that not only have you and I been miseducated in reading, writing, and arithmetic, but we also been miseducated in theology. He said in schools of theology, Negroes are taught the interpretation of the Bible worked out by those who have justified segregation and winked at the economic debasement of the Negro. He says in theology, literature, social sciences, education, however, radical reconstruction is necessary. The old worn out theories as to man's relation to God and his fellow men, the system of thought which has permitted one man to exploit, oppress, and exterminate another and still be regarded as righteous must be discarded. For the new thought of men as brethren and the idea of God as the love of all mankind. So Carter G. Woodson said, you and I have been miseducated about God. Think over this, brother and sister. Henry Berry famously said, we have to keep black people in America from having access to light. He would, again, he wasn't just talking about the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. He's talking, when a man uses the term light, he's talking about divine wisdom. He said, and if you leave black people in America devoid of divine wisdom, they will be on the level of the beasts of the field. What do you see in the hood today? A young brother, 15 years old, can go and kill a sister who's a minister of the gospel. A sister who was working to help people like him. Now this kind of savage behavior in the hood coexists with an educational system that refuses to teach our babies what they need to know. It's by design. Right. Going all the way back to the plantation day. You think, brother and sister, that the mind of the plantation owner is gone just because the chains ain't on our feet and wrist no more? That mind is still there. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, in truth, gives that radical reconstruction of theology that Carter G. Woodson talks about. I know now, I have to acknowledge the fact that, you know, when I stand up here and say that Allah appeared in the person of Master Far Muhammad, that ruffles feathers. I know you kind of twisting in your seat, this is your first time hearing something like that. Because your pastor told you God is a spirit. But the Bible does say that. But it says those who worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. It is said those who worship it, worship it in spirit and truth. Spirits have no gender. You can't use a personal pronoun to describe a spirit. Personal pronouns are used to describe men and women. You and I have been miseducated about God, beloved. That's why it's hard sometimes for you to wrap your mind around the bold theological pronouncements of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. But did you know Adam's God was a man? He heard God walking. Spirits don't walk. <laughs> but Adam, the first man of the Bible, his God was a man. Moreover, the scripture says 
he made Adam in his image and his likeness. When you look in your mirror, you saw your image. It looked like you. So if man is God's image, what does God look like? He looks like a man. Abraham's God was a man. Read the 18th chapter of Genesis. The Bible says, and three men came to Abraham. One of them was the Lord. And then they call Abraham the father of all the other prophets. Abraham is Jesus' daddy. Abraham is Muhammad's daddy. Because Abraham's relationship with God became the model for every other prophet or messenger that followed him. So that means whoever was Abraham's God is all of the other prophets and messengers God. A human being. Moses' God was a man. Numbers chapter 12. Now this man is, has the job of freeing the slaves. And a man came to him. A man established a friendship with him. It says in Numbers 12, Moses, I talk to Moses like a man speaks to his friend and he beholds the form of the Lord. You mean Moses, God had a form? I know what y'all are saying. That's the Old Testament, Brother Muhammad. Jesus didn't say that. Wait a minute, Jesus did say it. Jesus, God is a man. The Jews were challenging Jesus because he was critical of their abuse of the people. He was critical of their abuse of the temple. They said, man, you ain't got no authority to correct us. He said, wait a minute now. It's written in your law that the testimony of two men shall be held as true. They said, yeah. He said, well, I'm one that bears witness. I have authority to correct you. And God the Father is the other. So Jesus, God, was not only a man, but he was a man that would defend him against the Jews. Watch out now. And in the Quran, it says that the Muslims had to believe in that which is revealed to Muhammad and that which was revealed before Muhammad. That's because Muhammad's God, the God that revealed the Quran to him, is the same God of all of the other prophets that came before him. So if Jesus' God was a man, if Moses' God was a man, if Abraham's God was a man, if Adam's God was a man, Muhammad's God's got to be a man. Why did the Honorable Elijah Muhammad refer to this man as our Savior? He said of him, he greatly rejoiced over us and was real happy that he had found us. He said that he would make a new people out of us who submit to him by causing us to grow into a new growth, not an entirely new body but a reversal of the old decayed body into a new growth, which he said would make all of us as we were at the age of 60. I know you and I have gone to some of our brothers and sisters from the Middle East. They have businesses. They have stores in our community sometimes. They don't really rejoice when they see you. They rejoice you spend money with them. But this man came from Mecca looking for black people. He don't look like too many of us, but he fell in love with us. And he rejoiced over us. He came to demonstrate that we are no longer forsaken. Check the history. Our African foreparents helped sell us into slavery. But Africa did not send nobody for us. We love Africa. That's the motherland. But they didn't send a redeemer for us. But one came for us. He wrote to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in a letter that I read, written to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said, I have treasured all my life love 
for the lost foundation of Islam. See, it's important for me to share this with you because if you go today and Google Master Far Muhammad, you're going to find search results to try to portray him as a con man. You're going to find search results to try to portray him as a man that was trying to deceive black people. You won't see the true history of this man that's at the root not only of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but as I showed you, he's at Malcolm X's root. He's at the root of Muhammad Ali. He's at the root of Imam Warthuddin Muhammad. He's at the root of Brother Khalid Abdul Muhammad. If you're a 5%er, he's at the root of Brother Clarence 13X. He's the root of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. A man that came from Mecca to find us, not to take from us, not to rob us, not to con us, not to deceive us, but to prove to us that we are worthy of the love of God. Again, my subject is, the subtitle is The Salvific Presence of Master Farrakhan post this online people said man what is Sal Vivi? <laughs> well according to the dictionary it means of or pertaining to redemptive power again savior a man that came for us after we had been in America fulfilling what the scriptures say of the children of Israel since 1555 400 years in bondage I know they tell you 1619 but according to uh, this book they started bringing certain black slaves in 1555 so in 1955 that's 400 years that's the prophecy of Abraham. That God would judge the enemies of Abraham's people after they were in bondage for 400 years. Master Far Muhammad came near the end of our 400 year period of suffering. Just like Jesus gave in the parable of the lost sheep. Jesus in the parable of the lost sheep says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. When most people read this in the Bible, they think this is a reference to the Jews in Israel. See, you and I, one of the things that we must learn and appreciate, we are the real children of Israel. You may or may not believe this, but the scholars among the Israeli people say that the biblical description of the children of Israel is not found in their history. Men like Shlomo Sands, who wrote the book, The Invention of the Jewish People. Other professors like Zev Herzog and Israel Finkelstein. Pulpit Rabbi of the Year, Rabbi David Wolpe. They say, yeah, we go through the Passover Seder, we go through Yom Kippur, but privately we have a problem. Because the people that these observances are really for, according to the scripture, it's not us. You wonder why they don't like Louis Farrakhan. And he's never taught any of us to harm the hair on the head of a Jewish man or woman. He said to us what Allah says in the Quran. If you are a Muslim and you see someone defacing a synagogue, you're supposed to stop them. You ain't supposed to let nobody harm a house of worship if you are a believer in Allah. 
but they hate him because of his teachings. They don't want you ever feeling little Aisha and Keisha in the hood that you are the woman of God. That you are the woman that the Messiah, he's not going to float down out of the sky. He's born from your womb. They have a philosophy in Jewish culture called the Messiah is the desire of women. They teach Jewish girls, be careful to live a modest life. Be careful to live a wholesome life because you need to be prepared in case God chooses you to give birth to the man that would deliver our people. They don't want us teaching black girls that. Who do you think is behind twerking? Follow the money. Who's behind the sexual objectification of black women, Latino women, and even poor white women? Who's behind it? But you don't see the daughters of the record executives on no poles swinging and twerking on the internet. They developed that perverse cultural expression for you and me. Because they know, no matter how articulate, how eloquent, how forceful, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan preaches. It is as he said, one song becomes greater than a thousand lectures. They say the young brother that killed the sister that's a pastor, I heard on the news that just a few days prior to that, he had been a part of like a scared straight program and they went and they visited one of the state penitentiaries in Tennessee. He was under mentorship. But see, after the mentorship, after the preaching, after the teaching, after the wise counsel, you putting on earphones you pulling out your cell phone and you're right back plugged in to the perverse cultural expression developed by our enemies. No, you the real children of Israel. That's your identity. You the real people of God. That's our identity. And to prove that this man came to give us and to show us the love of God he fulfilled all of the scriptures pertaining to what God would do. Not only would he search out his lost sheep and find them, but he would form them into a nation. He gave us a flag because the scripture said that the children of Israel would be formed into a holy nation. That nation that the Quran calls the best nation raised among men. Yes, Thou art not forsaken. Come on now. He began to teach us what foods to eat and what foods to store in our house. If you ain't got them two books, how to eat to live, get those books. And you come among the Muslims and you begin to wonder, how old are these people? You can't hardly tell our age. Because we don't eat what the Bible says they gave to the children of Israel. Say that when they were in bondage, they were force fed the king's meat and the king's drink. We might make that analogous today to pork and alcohol. That's the king's meat. Who was that in, in one of the brands, King Cotton? The old smoked sausages? And even though drugs altogether are bad, the most abused one statistically is alcohol. But when they were in captivity, Daniel and the Hebrew boys, they rejected the king's meat and the king's drink. And the scripture said that they had a better physical appearance. They were sharper mentally. They were more energetic because they asked for something called pulse. Beans. Master Far Muhammad told the honorable Elijah Muhammad, Elijah, teach them to eat the navy beans. The best food for you and I. Giving you all the nutrition you need. And as an added help protects you against radiation. You got one of these in your pocket, you're exposed to the EMF every day. 
electromagnetic frequencies and radiation. See, we were a lost people. One of the great black professors, he described our condition as being a condition of NATO alienation. He says, NATO alienation is the estrangement or disconnection from historical memory, which occurs by severing an individual from their kinship traditions, cultural heritage, including language and religion, and economic inheritance through experiences of social death. It creates the conditions in which an individual, now estranged from knowledge of their social heritage, can become a commodity defined by their relationship to systems and structures that often cause and benefit from their alienation. In other words, a forsaken people. Cut off from who we really are. So the history says, that Master Fra Muhammad began to take away our slave names. Just in Detroit, in three years, he gave out 25,000 holy names. And the authorities in Detroit, they were upset with him. He was disturbing their niggers. You know, the white power structure, they don't like you disturbing their niggers. Who's bothering our niggers? And they start seeing black men who were at that time keep the context of when the Savior came to us in mind. The 1930s, the beginning of the Depression. Many of our foreparents left the South, thought it would be better in the North, and they found poverty in the North. But they came to Master Far Muhammad's classes. And they gave up their vices. They came to Master Far Muhammad's classes and they began to stand up tall and comport themselves with dignity and intelligence. They came to Master Far Muhammad's classes and they appeared to be infused with a courage and a fearlessness that caused the white power structure and the authorities in Detroit to become afraid. So he gave us back our name. The scripture says God would do that. Yeah, yeah. The nations will see your vindication in all the kings, your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. In another place it says, I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. My God. Brother, quit holding on to being Mr. Jackson. Oh, Sister, quit being Mrs. Johnson. Mrs. Smith. Allah gonna destroy those names. Those names don't have no place in the hereafter, in the kingdom of God. God has to give us a new name. Name represents possession and ownership, but name also indicates function and purpose. In one place in the scripture it says, a good name is better than God. He took away our slave name. And if you come into the nation of Islam, that's your first assignment. You have to write a letter asking that your slave name be taken away. One of the greatest tools of the enemy was our miseducation. So he set up a school for us. In the 30s, I know independent black education, home schools, African American cultural curriculum, all of those are buzzwords and trends today that you don't ruffle no feathers speaking publicly. But in 1930, going into the ghettos of Detroit and establishing something called the University of Islam and pulling your children out of the public school system, this was a declaration of war. And Master Far Muhammad did on our behalf. So as you see, they raided the school. And if you read Message to the Black Man in America, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad describes that our very first altercation with the police was over the educational rights and privileges of a little black girl named Sally Allah. Sally and her parents didn't want to go a part of the Detroit public school system. And if you read some of the newspaper accounts 
of when the federal government came in because of this. See, they didn't just allow the Detroit authorities to handle this. Amen. The feds came in. And they interviewed little Sally. They asked Sally, what are they teaching you down there at their university? And Sally told him, among other things, said, you know, God is going to punish you and you're going to be fighting to survive. That's on record. And you imagine the terror in the hearts of the white power structure that a little bitty black girl is forecasting the doom of America. Where did she get these ideas from? It may sound outrageous back then, but have you watched the news? <laughs> Don't you see America on fire? Europe is on fire. I was just on the phone yesterday talking with our dear brother, student minister Abdul Hakeem Muhammad. And I said, you know, they say on the news that there's not a whole lot of people with air conditioning in London where he lives. He said, yeah, brother, we don't, really, we don't never need air conditioning in London. It's, they never really get that hot. But now it's over 100 degrees in the United Kingdom. Great Britain, the mother of America. See, Allah promised to punish all of those nations who were involved in the destruction of his people. And of course, you got the modern Muhammad University of Islam today. He formed us into a military, brother. See, when you are forsaken people, one of the means of that is you don't have no protection. And Allah says in the Holy Quran, he raises up men to repel other men. Otherwise, the earth is overrun. So, there literally is newspaper accounts of the FOI in the early 30s fighting against the police and the police dying. Now, we don't carry no weapons. But they were abusive to us in the courtroom and the melee broke out in the courtroom. And after the dust cell and the smoke clears, the Muslims were unharmed. But the people that had arms and weapons, they were harmed. See, this religion, what Master Far Muhammad gave to us, it removes fear from us. That's why you always see, and sometimes it goes to something of an extreme, but you see people always want to invite us to be their security. That's both good and bad. Because a lot of raise us up to protect you while you do sin and evil. We are people who are in possession of divine wisdom that can save your life. Now, we don't mind protecting you. You are our brother and sister, but you got to come away from a life of sin and evil if you want that kind of relationship to continue. For black women, he formed a class, fulfilling what the scripture says, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. I was reading an article. I think it was in Elle magazine. They had Nicki Minaj on the cover looking like a Muslim woman. And in the article, she was lamenting the fact that she had projected an image that was harmful to young black women and girls. See, because don't forget that I know they say, well, it's just music, it's just art. But that kind of expression coexists simultaneously with the abduction of women and girls, where they say now is more than 64,000 of them that have been abducted. They say some of the street gangs in certain parts of the country, they don't deal in drugs no more. They sell women. So at the root of fueling that kind of wickedness is a cultural expression that cheapens the value of women in the eyes of men. But what Master Far Muhammad brought radically destroys that. The scripture says, 
that when they would come out, they would come out with great substance. And in 1974, I believe it was, National Secretary Abbas Rasul said that the Nation of Islam had amassed more than $50 million in property, businesses, land. Now that's 50 million 1970s dollars. Which might be five billion today, I don't know, because the dollar keep going down. So what he brought us and the result is the fulfillment of scripture. Compromise of 1877 proved the US government would not any longer protect us. See, the safety and the security of those whom you love is one of the greatest indicators that you love them. You don't allow nobody you love to be vulnerable to attack. So there's something in the scriptures about the chariot of God. There's something in the scripture about God, you know, a human being inhabiting the sky. In some places it's called the New Jerusalem. In some places it's called the chariot that's like a whirlwind. Ezekiel called it a wheel within a wheel. But it has a purpose of executing God's wrath on the wicked. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that Master Fah Muhammad said, Elijah, look out there in the sky. And he identified for him a dreadful looking plane. Now this is in the 1930s. And many people for a long time mocked the nation of Islam belief in the reality of Ezekiel's will. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad called it the mother plane. And he described its construction in detail because in fact Master Far Muhammad is the builder of the wheel. He's behind the UFO phenomenon. You don't have to take my word for it. Look into it yourself. My brother right here wrote an excellent book about it called UFOs in the Nation of Islam. You should get his book. We're not just up here. I, I, I think I have sounded rational so far. I, I, I think I have put together a cogent argument so far. So I ain't no nut. I ain't some wild-eyed conspiracy theorist. But I'm telling you what the U.S. government just admitted 92 years after Master Far Muhammad gave it to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So there's a power behind the nation of Islam. There's a power present to protect the black man and woman in America. Oh, brother and sister, thou art not forsaken. And the Lord is not displeased. All praise is due to Allah. I want to conclude this message because it's one thing to see yourself as a part of a group that God is not forsaken. You know, somebody famously said, there's no I in team. <laughs> but then somebody responded, but there is me in team. <laughs> so it ain't enough sometimes with the pressures to bear on the minds of the believing men and women just for a group identity of being not forsaken. Because you are not crowd in the night. What about me, Lord? See, Muhammad, as a faithful man, he know God always looks out for the believer. But he wanted to know, God, have you forsaken me? Because I'm going through hell. I'm going through difficulty. I'm striving to be your servant, but that has not immunized me from difficulty, pain, suffering, 
disappointment in my life. And I reading in the scriptures, and I drew a conclusion that feeling forsaken is actually a part of the sunnah or the way of prophets and messengers. That we say we follow. Long before Jesus said it, David said it. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now David is called the friend of God. David killed Goliath. He was the anointed king of the children of Israel. He had some other stuff going on in his life, but the beauty of David, even though he was a sinner, he is sinner or he is redeemed sinner par excellence. Because when you read the Psalms, most of the Psalms are the Psalms of David. They are beautiful because they reflect the repentant heart of a man who has sinned. But he believes and trusts wholeheartedly in God. They gave away his life of sin to come closer to God. But at a certain point, David cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? Gideon, the great commander of the army, said, when times got rough, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all of this befallen us? That's a good question, isn't it? Jesus on the cross. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? A few days ago, my and our illustrious teacher, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, put on Twitter, don't you ever think that because you try to do righteousness, that God shouldn't try you. This is how God knows whether you are his. He'll bring misfortune into your life and watch to see how you handle it. Some of us can only follow God if he does everything we want him to do. Wow. I sometimes see the pastors on TV, they say, all you got to do is send the praises up and the blessings come down. God being described something of a supernatural ATM machine. You know, you put your card in, you get your money out. I believe and I have felt for some time, I have to say that there are many who are guilty of religious malpractice. And since they went down and they got a license from the authorities, they should get their license revoked. <laughs> the way they be representing God causes people not to follow and obey God the way they should. But Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, also said in a hadith, how wondrous is the affair of the belief. He says, I am amazed by the belief. If he is granted goodness, he praises Allah and is grateful. But if he is afflicted with a calamity, he praises Allah and is patient. See, when faith becomes rooted within us, it involves us trusting and having the fundamental belief that God is for us. Why believe in God if you don't believe God is for you? Why believe in God if you only can relate to God as though he is upset with you? He is not interested in seeing you succeed. See, when you trust God and you have faith in him and you believe he's for you, then even though pain comes in your life, difficulty comes in your life, you're able to say like Muhammad said we praise Allah and we are patient you know we open back up in November we have been closed for almost two years 
We didn't interview the believers to ask you what you went through in them two years. We're just happy to see you. But a wise man knows that whether you say it or not, the time touched all of us. Everybody went through something. Everybody experienced something of the pressure of the hour. So now this is Muhammad's mosque, a house under Master Fard Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. But I'm reminded that the scripture says, and the house of wisdom can become the house of mourning. And when you couldn't come to the mosque, how did it make you feel? When you couldn't be around the believers, how did it make you feel? We don't know the crosses each other bear. We don't know the challenges one another faces. But just know that every brother and sister you see, the one sitting next to you, the one with the beautiful smile, the one with the warm greeting, the one preaching the word, we all have gone through something dealing with the hour that is upon us. The enemy called it a, a, a pandemic. But the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said it was a divine pestilence. In other words, COVID-19 is controlled by God. <laughs> Similar, how wondrous is the affair of the believer. The prophet said that whenever anything happens for the believer, and only for the believer, good is in it. Even pain. I listened to the great Bishop T.D. Jakes one day teach a subject. And he was talking about the difference between incidents and outcomes. And he was making the point because there's a place in the scripture that says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Dangerous are the kisses of an enemy. And he was showing how that even though God is the best friend that the believer can have sometimes in your relationship with God God will wound you but that's the incident the outcome which sometimes while we're being wounded we can't see the outcome what the outcome will be we can't see that far down the road but the outcome is always for our good always for our benefit so again, the prophet, peace be upon him, said, Wondrous is the affair of the believer, for there is good for him in every matter. And this is not the case with anyone except the believer. Never forget, brother and sister, that we follow in the path of the prophets and messengers of God. So they modeled what we should expect if we are to have a relationship with God. They went through periods where they felt forsaken, abandoned, called out and left out. But because of their great faith, Allah always exalted them. And I don't care what you're going through or what you've gone through, if you hold on to your faith, Allah is going to exalt you. He says in the Holy Quran, these are the believers in truth, for them are with their Lord exalted grades and protection and an honorable sustenance. He says in the 40th surah, exalter of degrees, Lord of the throne of power, he makes the spirit to light by his command upon whom he pleases of his servants that he may warn men of the day of meeting. In the 58th surah it reads, O oh, you who believe when it is said to you make room in assemblies, make room. Allah will give you ample. And when it is said rise up, rise up. 
Allah will exalt those of you who believe and those who are given knowledge to high ranks and Allah is aware of what you do. When Master Far Muhammad departed from among us, I heard my teacher, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan say that he pressed into the hand of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad the 23rd Psalms. If you read the 23rd Psalms, it's one of the Psalms of David. And when I was reading the 23rd Psalms, I also read the 22nd Psalms. It's equally or even more powerful. But that giving of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want you read it before. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. He spreads out a table before me in the midst of mine enemies. He put that in the hand of Elijah Muhammad. Well, if he put it in the hand of Elijah Muhammad, he might as well have put it in your hand and my hand. Because he was telling the honorable Elijah Muhammad, I'm leaving, but I will be your good shepherd. I'm leaving, but I will be with you always. I'm not going to continue to dwell among you right now, but I will create table for you in the presence of your enemies and trust and believe the most powerful enemies in the world are the enemies of Elijah Muhammad Louis Farrakhan and the nation of Islam don't get it twisted this small humble place is extraordinarily significant we are some of the most opposed people in the world do you know that an African nation, Libya, wanted to give the Nation of Islam over a billion dollars and the U.S. government said no? See, so you see talking heads on YouTube and other places saying, well, why Farrakhan ain't doing this? Why he ain't doing that? You come and try to do what Minister Farrakhan has done to help black people and, see the, uh, and attract the opposition he's drawn, and then you show us your results. A man that is so feared that he have love among entertainers and athletes, but they're afraid to be public with their support. No, this is the nation of Islam. This is the nation that Allah in the person of Master Far Muhammad has established. We are the proof and the evidence that Allah has not forsaken black people in America. And if you believe and submit to him, he shall not forsake you. Beloved brothers and sisters, I leave you as I came before you in the greeting words of peace and paradise. Assalamu alaikum.